Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our second day of Storage Field Day 3. We are here at uh, Next Gen Storage. Um, we were planning on, you know, talking about some products and some technology and stuff, but then this guy stepped in, and uh, unfortunately, I think we've got a sidetrack here into a little different topic. So uh, this is actually really cool. Thank you guys for, for having uh, the Fusion I.O. Next Gen combination discussion at Tech Field Day. You, you know, we planned the acquisition just so it would be the day I, before. I, I know that you did. Um, you know, the, the insiders in the industry told me that you did, so I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm glad you decided to do that. So without further ado, let me turn it over to you folks. Uh, we've got a pair of uh, CEOs here, and uh, we'll let you guys explain what you're doing. So I'll step aside. Sounds good. Thanks, Steve. Great. Well, welcome to NextGen, uh, a division of Fusion IO, officially. So. <laughs> here, here. Congratulations. <laughs> No, we are uh, extremely, extremely excited about the combination and the potential for products and, and markets and opportunities and uh, couldn't be more excited about the technology and, and the opportunity before us. And uh, it's a great, uh, great combination. As you guys know, we've been working with Fusion since 2010, integrating their product into our product and building some really unique value and software around that and having that capability to do some very unique things gives us a huge advantage in the marketplace and we we plan on uh, digging into that with you guys and and telling you a little bit more about what we're up to so yeah thanks John so uh, let me tell you why why next gen first it's an awesome team these guys uh, built left hand networks they know how to how to address this market really well but from fusion IO's perspective it takes let me take back a minute Take you back a minute to the uh, understand our business model and uh, what Fusion IO is doing. So uh, many people think that Flash is a disruptor in the in the enterprise business, but it actually goes beyond the fact that Flash uh, causes one to re-architect a lot of stuff in how the data center works. It actually also goes to business model and how product is sold. What we realized is that with the miniaturization that Flash allows, the componentry can become competent enough and encapsulate the feature set to subsume systems level capabilities and be sold as a platform. Over time, with miniaturization, for example, the microprocessor became a platform along with Microsoft Windows, and that platform made it possible for people to easily build computer systems from a platform, thus undermining the closed systems model of a mainframe. So we view Flash as the opportunity to transform the storage world, which is still stuck in the mainframe era of closed proprietary systems, where you pay 3x for everything that goes into that storage system, every disk drive, every piece of memory, because the box is literally a barrier to anybody adding things into it. You can't load anything on it, add anything in it, where you don't pay that on-ramp. The reason why that proprietary closed model has survived this long is because with disk drives, it takes rocket science to build a reliable performing system. It takes something the size of a refrigerator with hundreds of mechanical drives, all kinds of sheet metal. And very few companies have earned the trust to be able to build those. But with Flash, it is changing that picture entirely. Now you can miniaturize that performance and complexity, encapsulate it, and provide it as a platform that can be delivered, embedded inside of open systems, inside of off-the-shelf servers, for example. So Fusion IO has been uh, driving this business model. People confuse what we are as a company. They think, well, these guys are just a, a component. That would be kind of like assuming that NVIDIA is just a component, yet they took over the workstation. You don't see SGI, Evans and Sutherland's son, anymore. The workstation was transformed by this same thing. So uh, we have been addressing the high end of the market with our products. The, there are, maybe I could, I don't know, sh should we, can we whiteboard something? We've got a technical group here. Yeah? Okay. So. No, 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 we like PowerPoint. <laughs> I can erase that? Yeah, 
So what I want to do is take a just, just a minute talking about this stuff. And then, and then please don't hesitate if you have a question just to raise your hand. This is not meant to be We're a monologue. <laughs> so there are a number of ways to consume Flash uh, in, in the data center. And Flash is actually driving uh, a shift in the architecture. So one way to do it is to put Flash directly in the server as a direct attached storage resource. This model is highly conducive to the scale out world. That's why you see a lot of our customer base, Apple and Facebook uh, and Pandora and, and Spotify and Box and... Do you think recognizable these, customers? No, <laughs> none of those guys. Just to put it in perspective, between Apple and Facebook, we have sold nearly a half a billion dollars worth of product, those two customers alone. Okay? Wow. Now, uh, they're using it in this model where the flash is local to the server and they're using the application to do the replication. This is the most potent way to deploy flash because you get the most performance for the lowest cost because you've reduced the complexity. So flash as direct attach works well on these large scale applications in the scale out world. And we're actually seeing this scale out model not just working for open source, but for proprietary software. Usually, if you're paying for Oracle, you don't want your server to sit idle. So you beef up the storage system. You put lots of memory in it. You scale up so that you're not sitting idle because you don't want to pay for an Oracle license that's sitting there idle most of the time. If you're using open source, scale out works because you don't mind the underutilization of those software licenses because they cost zero. Right? So there has tended to be a scale up world of commercial software and scale out of free. And the pivoting reason why you choose the one over the other is, or the reason is because the inability to supply enough data, the data starvation would mean underutilizing those software licenses. So you pay a lot to beef up the supply chain of data in open source. Let me, let me try to drive this home with a specific example. Apple has been using Oracle for their iCloud and other databases to keep track of, of billings and so forth. Um, they had been using NetApp uh, behind that, uh, that database. Um, they uh, evaluated the exadata because with NetApp they weren't able to get to the performance levels that they needed. The exadata gave them some 9,000 transactions per second putting Fusion I.O. directly attached inside of a server, they got 40,000 transactions per second out of the gate. It was four times the transaction rate at a quarter of the cost. So instead of using the scale up model of big storage systems and big fat servers, they flipped and went to a scale out model of using just uh, Oracle Data Guard to replicate between two servers. My point is, this is the way that gives you the, the most performance, the lowest cost out of the thing, and ironically, it's also the most reliable because it's a shared nothing architecture. But you have to architect the application environment to do the replication at the app. Now the second model is server local flash as a cache in front of your shared storage. Let you interoperate with existing storage. This uh, is the technology uh, that uh, we call IO Turbine. IO Turbine allows you to cache uh, in very complicated environments, such as those that are using hypervisors and virtualization. Why is that complicated? Because workloads can migrate around. And if you're putting a lot of data cached at the server, that data needs to follow it. Otherwise, you've, you, you would break vMotion and the ability to migrate workloads. So uh, we've been able to do that because we have some of the guys who wrote the IO subsystem inside of the, the uh, the hypervisor from VMware, the ESX hypervisor. It's actually more sophisticated than the stuff that EMC offers. That's why they've taken it as That's a bit of an embarrassment fun. that you know, they own VMware and yet uh, Fusion IO has a higher, <laughs> tighter integrated uh, caching solution for the virtualized environment. Uh, this one um, is, uh, it lets you rely on your, your existing storage. You don't have to change anything about how you manage your data. You just get it to go faster. So now you can put higher workloads on it. This is a, a fun example. Um, running Oracle in this environment 
actually having it be faster than Oracle running on bare metal. And one of the reasons for that is this caching software plugs in within the guest operating system and services the I.O. from the flash cache before the I.O.s have to actually tunnel down to the hypervisor, much less go out over the network. So um, supplying I.O.s faster than they are even supplied in a bare metal environment is, is pretty cool. The, the, uh, the third way of deploying flash is to actually have a server with local flash. Notice all of these, server with flash, server with flash here a server with flash, have that be your shared storage. Because it no longer, familiar. right. <laughs> now, well, you might have built something like that. <laughs> not quite yet, this, we'll get there, just a second. <laughs> this actually is uh, Fusion IO Ion. Ion is a software stack that can take a server with IO memory and turn it into a, an all flash appliance. And not just any, but one that has the highest performance of any memory appliance on the planet. It's using PCI Express Flash in an off-the-shelf server with either fiber channel, iSCSI, or uh, even InfiniBand, where it uses SRP. And this thing can do a million plus IOs per second. It's shared memory over a network. Now, one of the reasons why we've been able to do this is we've tricked out the SCST SCSI target stack that's at the heart of Linux. Anybody who's building <coughs> memory appliances today is using Linux, and at the heart of Linux is the agent which processes the storage requests as they come in from the network. That agent uh, is SCST. Um, th the company that built SCST. Uh, you <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So here's here's the three, and these all tended to address um, what I would call vertical application acceleration. These uh, uh, tended to address the high end of the market where people are dedicating flash to specific applications. Um, the, uh, the acquisition with NextGen is quite exciting because it allows us to do this, where you have your application servers and you have something like Ion that's in an off the shelf server that has the disk and the flash in it. It's actually kind of a combination of the caching and the ion, but where the caching, <coughs> where we're hybridizing the disks here. Now, this is very important for the market where people put multiple distinct workloads onto the same infrastructure for cost reasons, down in the mid-range market. So all of these addressed high-end markets where pure flash systems or the uh, performance uh, of local flash was called for. Uh, this allows us to address what's an even bigger market. This is a $16 billion mid-range market versus the high end, which is, which is like, like half that size. Um, so uh, this is very strategic uh, to Fusion I.O. And when you go to do this, to hybridize flash with disk, there's two key things. Um, you're faced with the same choices um, as with, with this. If, if you look at the universe of folks who are building flash appliances, you have three options. You can build using SSDs and propagate the baggage of legacy storage for when you access the flash. Or you can go to the other end of the spectrum and build a Frankenbox that has flash that's all custom and you're building your own motherboards and putting your own CPUs. But then there, you have to put up a Gumbus <laughs> <laughs> we got tired of him a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, I know. We can talk about that. <laughs> no, we can't. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm not allowed to. Okay. Um, but uh, so that is really not sustainable to do $200 million to go and build your own proprietary box. And there's no need to do it because there is a third alternative, and that's to use bus attached flash flash that's managed like a memory on the PCI Express bus. And so if you look at those three different ways to consume flash, you don't want to propagate the legacy storage baggage. You also don't want to go and build you know, some Frankenbox all the way from the ground up. You need something uh, that uh, gives you memory attached flash. And that's really what, uh, what one of the two things, well, many things, but one of the primary two things, one is the use of memory attached flash to get that performance level. One of the, the key things that that allows uh, the, the NextGen team to do is to actually trust the flash 
to hold the data, to do right caching, right back caching, to where this is actually ingesting the data. In other words, they can accelerate the writes, whereas somebody like Nimble doesn't trust the flash array that's on SSDs. It only accelerates reads. It's only half a hybrid because it doesn't accelerate but half of the IOs that go through the thing. Because the write requests, they take straight to the disk drives, not trusting the, the sole copies of the data to be held on the flash. So those are the first two things. One, memory attached flash. Second, trustworthy enough to accelerate the other half of the IOs, the write IOs. And thirdly, once you hybridize this thing, you need to be able to allocate and provision specific amounts of performance to specific applications. Because the whole point of this in the mid-range is to support a broad diversity of applications on a shared infrastructure. And to have it be dialable between putting it to where it's got the performance of an all-flash array, maybe other people's all-flash arrays, Ion's still, still, <laughs> still a little faster. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to integrate technology and make this stuff faster, like the SCST2. But, uh, uh, and then the, uh, the, uh, the other thing is to have applications that don't have much performance requirements and dial them down. And one of the, the, the most important things about this is, is we view it very different than just QoS. QoS is kind of like saying, you're a higher priority than you, you're a higher priority than you. You're just laying out the priority on a one-dimensional thing, right? Today's world is much more complicated than that. There's a difference between how much performance an application needs and what its priority is. VDI needs a whole lot of performance, but at the end of the day, it's not as high a priority as mission-critical applications. So uh, this is, uh, I say, not even the same thing as QoS. This is to be able to provision uh, specific amounts of performance to different applications and to do that somewhat independently of the, uh, of the, um, um, the prioritization of them. So that's the quick overview of where this fits in um, and uh, um, let me open it up to questions. So would it be fair to assume that um not right now, the Fusion I.O. cards would be inserted into the next-gen um, uh, boxes and sold as a, uh, as a solution? So, thank you for asking. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the true disruptive potential of Flash is not just in the changing of the architecture, but the changing of the business model and the value chain. Today, systems are sold by the stack up of, let's say here you have raw NAND, that, that cost one dollar, just, just for simplicity's sake. Um, I, I should draw this in proportion then so I can get the, the right proportions out of it. Now, somebody like uh, a Virident or an LSI takes that NAND, puts it on a system, and uh, doubles its cost so that they can make 50-point gross margins. So now it costs two dollars. Somebody like EMC takes that thing and marks it up by 3x, <laughs> no, seriously, because they want to make 66% gross margin. 66 means I have to take that times 3, right? So now that thing that costs 2 costs 6. Well, it costs 12, but they give you 50%. Exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very true. So the list, price, the list price is way the heck up here, right? No, it's, it's how it works, right? Uh, and this is the combination of systems vendor, plus the, the, the component vendor, you know, plus the, the chip vendor underneath it. So what Fusion I.O. is doing, both with ION and will be doing with NextGen, is very radical in terms of changing the value chain. You start with that same piece of NAND that costs a dollar. Fusion I.O., let's say we put our 66% gross margin. Actually, right, yeah, gross margin of 50. We've got to make a little bit more. Yeah, right, okay, so this is three dollars. Right, then this goes either to the end user customer, if they're one of these hyperscale guys who do their own integration, or it goes to an integrator that makes what? Maybe 15% gross margin on it. So the difference is integrator and platform. Integrator and platform changes the pictures from system and component. Either way, you end up with a finished product, but is the product at $3 or is it at $6? This is the same thing that happened in the mainframe market. The mainframe vendors <coughs> had that closed system marked everything up. As soon as the componentry became competent enough, miniaturization of microprocessors, the software from Microsoft, the systems vendors gave it away. They gave Microsoft 
carte blanche to go off. You're just a component. I can always wrap you in my sheet metal and mark it up. You have no power. Whoops. Intel and Microsoft no had all the power. Well. And the guys that put the sheet metal around it, the integrators, they have to compete more. And so what we're doing is building a platform that has all of the competency in it so that a mere integrator can build a system from it. That's the Synex Hive. Or even the server OEMs have businesses where they integrate appliances for reasonable markups to provide those to the channel. So uh, we are going to be, it's, we are going to be selling appliances in the sense that my sales team is going to be working with customers to have them buy appliances. But they're going to buy them through these integrators. Fusion IO is not going to touch the disk drives or the box, which means we don't have to put any markup on the disk drive or box. I've shown here the NAND. If we look at, this, at the disk drives, that's even more compelling because the disk drive gets marked up by 3x by, by the systems vendor or by going straight to the integrator, 15%, 20%, which means the disk drive costs way less than half as much. Or even the end user can source their own. That's an open system where you can put your own stuff in it. And when you switch to a platform model, you can do that. Yeah, what's really key about all this, you know, as you go through the, this progression of products, you have Fusion in the server, you have 100% flash, you have hybrid flash and disk. <clears throat> but was, what's really disruptive about it is this. So this is a common denominator of all this. And uh, I, was, I was talking at a partner event the other day, and I was, I was showing people this card, and they said, well, great, that's a Fusion I.O. card. But, Little do people know, this card runs faster than 90% of the hybrid storage systems out there with, you know, potentially hundreds of disks in them. You know, and, and the reason behind that is the architecture. It's PCIe-based architecture. Most storage systems, if you open the, open the box, there's a controller card, a disk controller, and they're coming out with faster controllers, and there's a controller specialized for SSDs, but they all plug into a PCIe slot. So as fast as they can run is one PCIe slot worth of bandwidth, right? No matter what you put on the controller, the fastest processor on the planet, it can't go any faster than that PCIe slot. This thing runs on its own PCIe slot. It doesn't run behind a controller. So imagine a controllerless system with multiple buses working for you, multiple data paths feeding multiple buses versus everything funneling through a single bus to a big fan out back end of SSDs or spinning disks. All those architectures are broken, whether it's EMC, VNX. You know, if, if you look at what EMC was doing around Lightning, that was more towards this. Guess what, they gave up because they realized Fusion IO was two years ahead of them. So they bought a substandard system, Extreme IO, that still has SSD, SSD. behind a controller. <laughs> you know, it's, that whole architecture is obsolete. You know, if you look at all the hybrid systems yeah, it out like there. EMC customers want to buy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. EMC customers that want to stay dependent on EMC will buy whatever EMC sells them. But, but many customers want out from under that uh, proprietary nature. But this is so technically disruptive. Everybody's going to have to design, redesign their data paths, back end, software management, their I.O., you know, you know, EMC's on Flare 90, version 90, whatever it is, you know, but they're going to have to rewrite that entire stack to handle multiple data paths through PCIe buses. That's probably why they gave up on the Lightning project. But this is extremely disruptive. There's new standards emerging that, you know, the NVMe standard, the SCSI Express standard. People are realizing, all these big companies are realizing that the bus to the PCIe the bus to flash should be through a PCIe bus. You know, nobody puts memory behind a drive wire, right? Nobody puts RAM behind the drive wire. Well, and Texas memory used to. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a terribly small niche because wasting a good memory device is a waste of a good memory device. Right. <laughs> so, so we're going to see a transformation in the industry and Fusion IO, regardless of what product you're talking about, is ahead of the game. And with, with regards to hybrid, it's all about you know, mid-range customers need performance and they need capacity. You know, our typical customer has between 100 and 200 terabytes of, of storage needs, and it, it doesn't all have to be fast. 
some of it needs to be fast, and some of it needs to be fast at certain times, and then it can be slow at other times. That's what our software is all about. We can dynamically tier data based on service levels and QoS settings to give the customers the performance they need when they need it for the applications that need it, and then put it on slow disk when it's idle. And it's not, you know, it's not, it's proactive tiering based on a requirement for performance versus after the fact tiering. You look at all the other tiering algorithms out there, they look for hot blocks on disk or SSD, and then they move it to a faster tier if the blocks get hot. Well, where were they when they got hot in the first place? They were in the wrong tier, right? And what's hot today is not necessarily going to be hot tomorrow. And so the after the fact tiering reactive automation is something of the past. What customers want is we say we want to go this fast and set it like cruise control in your car. You set the cruise control at 60 miles an hour, and then as the I.O. load picks up, guess what? It presses the accelerator, which means <coughs> we're tearing more data into flash or RAM. And then, you know, if you're going down a hill and things slow down, you can start moving that stuff back down to cheaper disk. And so, you know, this is this is what built, you know, this is what helps the economics of storage is to deliver the best dollar per gig, best dollar per IOP, both those combos in a mid-range package for that customer. I was musing the other day that the uh, VNX, renamed Clarion, <laughs> was acquired from Data General in 1999. Right. It's literally from last millennium. And they're still running <laughs> Flare. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was just a couple years ago they went from 32-bit to 64-bit with CX4, right? With they're still emulating the instruction set of that old mini computer that it was built on. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> the, uh, some, of, some of those legacy systems, you know, I, I've taken to calling them mild hybrids. It's kind of like that Chevy pickup right. that got one mile an hour more because they could call and it And the hybrid. problem is, is that, that, it, that it's awkward, right? You and, and you really have to take the potential to the maximum of being able to dial all the way up to the performance of flash and to the capacity of disk. And one of the things that excite me that, uh, that John uh, failed to mention is that when you put flash out front, you can actually use deeper, less expensive disk drives right. so that the cost capacity equation changes as well. Um, well, let's see, what more can we tell you? The, the uh, um, oh, here's a, here's, here's a fun part. Um, with uh, Dave Bangs, who uh, built left-hand networks right. sales, right? Uh, uh, From zero to 100 million. That's right. <laughs> and, and then uh, uh, Jim Dawson, our head of sales, built 3PAR. Um, and then we have uh, uh, Jay, name just slipped my mind. Um, he came in with Jay Phillips. I, Phillips, thank you. Uh, IO Turbine. Uh, he was the head of sales at IO Turbine. And he was also at Equalogic. Help yeah. build Equalogic's yeah. channel. Yeah. So yeah, Equalogic, yeah. left hand networks, three. We can sell these things. <laughs> <laughs> What's really interesting about uh, you know this architecture as well. For example, we were we we were talking to an Equalogic customer the other day, and he was very disappointed that he spent you know, tens of thousands of dollars to put SSDs in his array. So he unplugged the 15K drives, put in SSDs. He said, I only got about 2X the IOPS. Mm -hmm. You know, he was pleased they got a little more, but he said, I paid a lot for that, right? You know, the, the reality is he should have gotten 100 times the IOPS or 1,000 times the IOPS, right? You know, because the problem is it was all behind that controller, all those SSDs, so the data path was limited by a single bus. And so, you know, Not to customer, mention the software stack. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that too. <laughs> it's a bigger part of it in many cases. Yeah, yeah, and so, you know, redesigning the software, the data path, the, the you know, having uh, a multi-data path architecture, multi-bus architecture gives us the capabilities in all these products to do some really amazing things. You know, and, and there's amazing things that David and I have talked about that we can't talk about publicly, but uh, there's a lot of opportunities synergy. going forward and synergies going forward with these products. So you guys are going to transition from appliances to software appliances? Uh, that's that's the way to think of it, yeah. Or software-defined storage, <coughs> right? Where it's... drink. <laughs> yep. <laughs> You know, and it's you know, and, and customers get confused. What's software-defined storage? It's kind of this nebulous it's, it's thing. It's what everyone under wants it to be. But uh, yeah, 
but the bottom EMC would have you believe there's symmetrics this software to find storage. <laughs> 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 I'm not kidding. They actually were saying that. I mean, there are platforms, off-the-shelf platforms that are enterprise-grade, <clears throat> and when you do the complete integration with our software, the Fusion, and and go, you know, customers want one throat to choke, a completely highly available design system. That doesn't mean the components need to be designed in-house themselves. Right. But the integration right. and the reliability and the metrics and testing and all that has to be done inside. So the, um, yeah, the, the model is many customers, especially in the mid-range, they won't see a difference. They are buying a fully integrated box. Yeah. But it has to do with the value chain that flows right. on that and the use of an integrator to source the drives in the chassis. Yeah. The, uh, and, the, and the problem is you now need a more sophisticated integrator. Um, that's that's right. right, somebody like Synex, who's been, been doing this for a while, or Dell's groups, or HP's group. Yeah. You know, the irony is those guys do that, and they do it for very low gross margins, and in the end you have a system that, that's very, very competitive. And the more sophisticated your software is, and the, you know, in the factory that's producing these, the less work the, the supplier needs yeah. to do. And that's our, that's our task, is to put enough of the capabilities into the platform. Hence the, the sophisticated software stack from NextGen. Uh, add that into the platform, Linux, software appliance, Fusion I.O., uh, test harnesses, vehicles like that to make the integration simple, so that we can basically, we're basically positioning an integrator in place of EMC, a systems vendor, and allowing the preeminence of the platform to grow versus what a mere component vendor is. And one of the key ingredients to that is the access to the end user. Because here's something very important. None of the existing players in the technology ecosystem are really our friend. Because we are shrinking how much of their equipment, their software licenses, it takes to get the job done. It, when you have one server able to do the workload of 10, like in this situation, right, then um, you know, it, it's kind of a, uh, uh, um, a love-hate relationship, even with our server vendors that sell our products. So we have to make sure that we're advocating at the customer, because they're the ones who are our friends. They're the ones that want that cost savings, and everybody else is just reacting to it. Um, and the same comes with the storage side of things. Does this mean we're going to have more flexibility up to play with the flash to disk ratio? And Absolutely. Uh, different systems with different ratios of flash to disk. And that's actually one of the, the, um, the aside from the cost differential of, com of platform integrator versus component systems vendor, the, the other most important thing is the flexibility and customization and the creation of more value in the ecosystem because they're able to do that. Yeah. For example, co-locating actual workloads and building application vertical specific appliances that are integral on the same platform. Okay. Right, customizing the software stack to actually include your application, customizing it uh, to include uh, you know, third party feature ads yeah. or channel mm -hmm. specialization. It's not like John and Kelly don't know anything about building the DSOs. <laughs> you know, exactly and right. it's instructive to look at, at, the, at, at the, the, the reason why a, a VSA kind of approach is viable. There's really two important things. One is with Flash, you have helped eliminate the biggest challenge with a storage appliance, and that is the variability in the storage subsystem. That getting enough performance, getting enough reliability with disk drives takes an awful lot of works, and you have to, it's a huge support matrix. Exactly. IO memory is the primary IO subsystem. It cleans up the data. <coughs> what flows to disk, then the disk subsystem is not nearly as critical to it. So it doesn't have to be the maintenance nightmare that it is. So that's the first one, is the reduce on the support matrix, because you've got control of the one piece that was so difficult inside of standard servers the I.O. subsystem. Does that RAID controller flush the data correctly when the power's cut? Do the drives correctly flush the data? All that kind of mess goes away when you are the I.O. subsystem, the primary I.O. subsystem. Secondly, how do you monetize it? If you're just selling software appliances, it's very difficult to make enough from them without it looking ridiculous to the end user. We still have a way to monetize it with the pull-through of the flash. So those are the two key things that make it possible to shift the model where it was not possible for other companies to do uh, uh, prior. Yeah, and a key thing about the, you know, the virtualization aspect of our technology, for example, in this lab you see next door, 
we test all of our software in virtual machines. That allows us to use a lot less hardware in our lab to do the testing because we can simulate all the hardware and data paths around it regardless of which system it's in or which fusion cards in the system or whatever it might be. We can virtualize that and, and, and test the data path that way. So I'm actually uh, talking about maybe future stuff. But what's really interesting is, I mean, you saw VMware acquire Versto. It was really interesting. We had that same technology at left hand, what, five years earlier, so we were kind of laughing about it, but uh, we've got some really, really, and, and what's, what, what's, what, what's, uh, what's, what's, really in, what's really interesting is we can scale flash independently of capacity, right? So um, if you want need better performance, you, you asked the question about um, are there different ratios? Yeah. Yeah, so customers can actually get the ratio that they need based on their environment. If they need a higher ratio, they can add more fusion cards to the head unit, which gives them higher performance. If they need more capacity, they can add a dish shelf and keep the same amount of flash. And so we offer that independent scalability, which is, by the way, that's truly unique in the market. Nobody else allows you to scale performance independently of capacity in the marketplace. Um, they can, you can upgrade your controller heads, I suppose, and do th some disruptive things like that. But it's but still the, going through the choke point of a RAID yeah, controller exactly. to get to those SSDs. Exactly. So you're not actually scaling performance right. even if you do add more right. SSDs. No, that's, that's We're so, adding but a, some of your competitors will let you scale out and, and cluster multiple controllers and, and add performance that way. Yeah, but what's so. the inter, intercommunication link between controllers and then how, how does that scale out? And is it as easy as popping a drawer out and putting a 200,000 I.O. card in the system and plugging it back in? <laughs> we, we, we can argue whether adding a device to your rack is easier than opening your system or not, but you know. Yeah, yep. But yeah, point well taken. But there's certainly a uh, scale out on the horizon as well, so. Yeah, but uh, one of your weaknesses has been that you know frequently we need more capacity. We just need to add another disk shelf. You know, got plenty of flash. Just need more. Yeah, drives. that's right. Yep. And, and that's where and that's so where now, this works. You know, the, the the ability for for a clever integrator like John to say, you know, this guy needs another flash card, but this guy just needs another six disk well, drives. Well, the, the the exciting thing is is right. that even the flash devices now with SCSI Express, uh, you have SCSI to the drive bay, and the ability to to add Fusion I/O memory in from the, the faceplate from the front. Are you pre-announcing a two and a half inch Fusion I.O. device? Oh, we've already demoed it. <laughs> we've, already, we've, we've already been showing it. It's, it's really a question of the chassis vendors uh, yeah. uh, doing we, we, it. Well, you got to get it. HP has, has already announced, et cetera. Right, and Dell has their half-assed. Right. But I'll tell you, that, that only gets, <laughs> yeah, their half-assed one, where you put a card in and the thing. <laughs> it's like, to replace having to put cards in there, put a card in and in the driveway. Right. Anyway, that didn't work too well. No, um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. You know, I did a blog post about it. You know, I, I have the standard PCIe slot completely. And just I have, yeah. yeah. Give, me a, give me an Ethernet card in that form. Factor. That's actually just really quite interesting. The, yeah. the, the one thing, though, that I see, though, and this this is interesting, is that in this market of the hyperscale, yeah, they don't want to waste the sheet metal and all of that. They're rack and stack, right? So there's but going those, to be a split. Those, guys, those, those guys are pure buy play. Truckloads of servers. They which, set them up when they die. And truck, leave them in place and truckloads of flash, which we like. Yeah, <laughs> but, but that's a yeah, that's a completely different. So and that's model. that's really kind of where the, our initial targets were, right. and our design target there was to make the flash devices. Um, it, this this is an interesting story for you. So we've now done four data centers with with Facebook. Um, and they just announced their fifth, sixth, and seventh. Is the, all three of them are going to be in Iowa? Um, and they've uh, the first two, they uh, use Flash as a hybrid, where they actually had local disks and Flash. And the last two, they've gone to pure Flash because the capacity points and the cost points got to where no need to have sense. no need to do a hybrid anymore within the system. Um, but when they deployed that first system, it was four plus years ago, and uh, and I remember working with the team, the, the gentleman who's been our advocate was brought in by Excel to build their infrastructure. He was the adult supervision. <laughs> We're talking about Jeff Rothschild, the guy who built Veritas Storage Foundation. So he knows storage really well. We clicked when we first met and had been working with Facebook when they were maybe a few hundred people and much, much smaller than MySpace. And uh, so we had been working for 
a couple of years where, I, from our founding, basically giving them product, having them look at it, and tell us that we need to do this or that with it. And it finally got mature enough that, that Jeff said, um, you know, I think, I, think it, it, I think it's ready now. We were looking at uh, uh, building the system. Maybe we'll use Fusion IO. Let me take a back story here. We had been recruiting Mr. Jim Dawson, who was selling the pinnacle of performance storage arrays, the three part and explain to him what we were doing with putting you know, the performance many, many times that of an entire storage array on a, a single PCI Express device with terabyte scale capacity. And he said, you know, if it does what you said it does, then that's, then, then that's game over. You won't aggregate disk drives for performance anymore. You'll only aggregate them for capacity. And uh, he called his contacts at the big banks. He called, back then MySpace was bigger. They were their biggest customer. He called MySpace, the MySpace guys to ask them about Fusion I.O. They had just started using Fusion I.O. They told them that, yeah, this is, this is game over for disk drives. And uh, yep. so Jim, jump ship, joins Fusion I.O. This is the year before 3 par gets sold. So he comes to Fusion I.O. a couple of months in. We're sitting down he going through the- He himself for abandoning those stock options. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we go down the list of, of customers and uh, he goes, um, um, well, I, I said, Facebook, I think, is ready to start buying in bulk. They've been buying a few to kick the tires, but you know I'm getting the signals that they're ready to buy. And he said, eh, we parked a million dollar array on their data center for a year, loaned it to them. They did all the testing, came back and said, your stuff is the best out there. Uh, you've got the design win. He said, and then they went quiet for a couple of months, came back and gave us a consolation prize, an order for a million bucks for the Oracle infrastructure, nothing compared to, the, to their user database tier. And uh, he said, and during this whole time, I never once got to meet with J-Ro. He likes to use nicknames. You mean Jeff Rothschild? Because that's who I meet with every quarter to go through stuff. And he's the one who told me that this database tier that they were going to use traditional storage arrays for, they were now thinking Flash was mature enough for. They've, that year, they deployed $100 million of Fusion I.O. If that had been on 3PAR, it would have cost at least three times that much if they could have afforded to buy it. They would have gone into the acquisition they could at HP. The power. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the acquisition at HP happened that year, and their revenue was topped out at, at 200. Just on on the <coughs> one deal alone, it cut their revenue in half. Yep. So, if you wonder how Flash has been impacting the storage array business, make no mistakes, it's been having a major impact. And this this model, especially for those who are at a large enough scale to architect pure infrastructure for the application, um, as you come down to the more enterprise world where they want to continue how they do their data management. They don't want to disrupt their storage administrators. That's the great thing. I don't have to go and sell to the storage administrator. I can sell to the application administrator and say, it doesn't change anything about how your data is managed. And if you want to get, still use the shared storage architecture, say because you're using Oracle Rack or something like that, but you want to get the cost structure of you know, servers instead of the cost structure of storage systems and the performance of flash than that model. Uh, this we're super excited about because we're able to address a new market. It's really the two things. If there's two things to take away from this, it's the technology differentiation. Part of it's the Fusion I.O. Part of it's the fact that they've architected the software suite to really leverage it to the hilt. So the technology is the first and the go-to-market model is the second. And I don't care what people say if they come out with stuff that's identical in the technology point of view. I don't think they can. But ultimately, it's the business model that's going it, to. It's, yeah. it, it's always been an attractive model to the geeks like me. That, you know, I understand. The, the, but mm -hmm. a lot, lot of people have done software stack to turn commodity hardware into storage. Only Veritas has and, ever really succeeded and with, none, with and, doing. And then, you know, Nextcent has been the most successful, and that's marginal at best. Right. And it's because of those two problems. They don't understand the system side of it. Well, it's the support matrix yeah. of dealing with I.O. subsystems as the variable. Having that variable float means you've got a common metrics problem when it comes to support. Yeah. Servers times the different types of I.O. subsystems right. and disk drives. And second is the monetization of it. You simply can't survive as a company 
Right. Uh, yeah, you do have you do have the pull through sales. Yeah, that's the key. Part of the problem is you you, just, you could never charge ten thousand dollars. Exactly. For that exactly. And yet you're on the hook for making sure that the data integrity works with whoever's I/O subsystem. It yeah. doesn't work because of those two yeah. things. And customers want one throat to choke, right? A right. completely integrated that's, system. That, that's the part I'm concerned about. And Your that is customer it, want, and customer that's, wants that's to buy something. Part that's got a Fusion I.O. nameplate on it so that they know to yell And that's you. the important thing. It's not Fusion I.O. nameplate. It's Fusion powered I.O. Exactly. As in, same as Intel inside. That's the power of a platform and having the brand awareness and the fact that my sales team is out there yeah. selling it directly and but we if, support it but directly. If, but, if in, but if Intel inside was powerful enough to do that, mm -hmm. Supermicro would sell a lot more servers compared to HP. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. No, that's that's one of the reasons why we're going with HP platforms, right? No, I, Dell and, platforms, those right, guys. And that's and their that's brands a, on it as well. We have no yeah. religion around the platform, but we do have specific requirements for availability, redundancy, yeah. right. speed, yeah. processors, amount of RAM, yeah. all those kinds of things. And there's very few systems out there that meet our specs today. But that doesn't mean that we can't use more than one system to build right. our to run our software stack. And, but again, customers buy it. And I'm, and I'm buy sure the guys from Quanta will be calling you soon. <laughs> <laughs> I was just in China. <laughs> All right. So uh, any further questions? This has been uh, a lot of fun. Thank you for uh, joining us today. The timing did work out just perfect. It, it wasn't planned, but we're, we're pleased that, <laughs> we, we liked uh, it. that it did. <laughs> so, um, yep. Yeah, guys, really appreciate you coming to our headquarters. It's awesome. It's a real, real pleasure to have you guys here. Real honor. And uh, hopefully we can do some more of these. Yeah. Didn't we just do one last summer, about six months You did, yeah. in November. Yeah. 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 yeah, in San Jose. Good All stuff. Right. Well, thank again. you very much. And uh, yeah, thank you guys. This shows a lot of, uh, a lot of commitment on the part of NextGen and Fusion IO to this independent you know, audience. And hopefully these guys will be able to uh, speak more intelligently about what, what this merger means and how it's going to affect the companies and the market. And so I appreciate you guys presenting this morning. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.